This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Joining us now, really looking forward to this, Rebecca Patterson here with a really wonderful heritage. Yes, her tour of duty at Bridgewater. But far more than that, uh, riding herd at Bessemer Trust on quiet money. Rebecca, there was a point yesterday, it was early in the press conference, where I thought they could verbatim it and run it as a Saturday Night Live skit, where the chairman was waltzing around the word data. We become data dependent. Whatever the the idiocy he was saying, the delicacies he was was saying, how did we get in this spot where we are jawboning a trend, waiting for data, and and just trying to get through a press conference with gobbledygook? How did we get here? (laughs) Well, I think the pandemic and the post-pandemic period created a lot of humility within central banks globally, including the Fed. And so I think that's probably made them a little bit more cautious on pounding any proverbial fists on the table in terms of where they're going with policy. Stick to the data releases if inflation stays on track, if growth moderates softly, wonderful, we can get some rate cuts this spring. Um, And if it doesn't happen, the Fed is allowed to change its mind. I think that's what Powell was getting at, but I think to the degree there was waltzing yesterday, so to speak, uh, it largely is a reflection of what happened in the last few years and, and them realizing how complicated this particular economic cycle is. And Rebecca, you know, the market seems to have heard what the Fed said yesterday. If you look at the WIRP function, the WIRP go, um, you know, in the March meeting, there was a 50 percent odds of a rate cut. Now that's down about 35 percent or so. So it seems like the market's getting the message. Is that kind of your, your take as well? Yes and no. I, I mean, I obviously the the uh, pricing in of March down, pricing in of May up now about 93 <laughs> percent odds of a cut in May. What was striking to me, though, is when we look at what's priced in for Fed funds today versus before the meeting is we still have about 150 basis points of easing priced in for this year. That hasn't changed really since before the press conference. So it's just getting compressed into a shorter time frame. And and I still am skeptical about that. I think you would have to see Mm -hmm. a lot of things go really perfectly right to get that amount of easing and get the double-digit earnings growth right. that's still priced in for the S&P this year. Uh, Rebecca Patterson with us, our tech analyst this morning. Rebecca, <laughs> I looked at the operating cash flow of Microsoft yesterday, and, and this is with your tour of duty at J.P. Morgan years ago. I think we really don't understand the size, the scope, the scale of Fortress Diamond, or frankly, Fortress Sachin and Nadella as well. Apple Computer today, pre-pandemic, they had $59 billion in free cash flow. Paul, basically they've done a double. Yeah, sure. I mean, in like four or five years. Do we understand the size of these companies, Rebecca, and how can we not own them if they're that dominant? I think you have to own them. The question is, are you underweight, benchmark weight, overweight? And with the valuations today, with the expectations for, for growth, as we've seen in the last few days, any disappointment versus what's priced in in the earnings season gets some profit taking. But if you take a longer term view, and and I try to on these things, I'm not day trading. Um, <laughs> you know, with that with that free cash flow, with the comparative advantages they have, the moats they have, the technology, the personnel. Yeah comparative advantage, whether we're talking tech or you mentioned JP Morgan, I would argue they're in that camp too. It, it's very hard to see them taken down. Now this year, as you know, we're going to have some regulatory hurdles for some of the tech stocks, which probably don't end with a decision. They'll go to the court. So it'll drag out for a while, but that could be another impetus for some profit taking. I'd say if you get that kind of profit taking on the tech stocks, it's an opportunity to buy for a longer term position. How do you feel about you know, we're, we're right smack in the middle of earnings, Rebecca. How do you feel about what you're seeing here in earnings and what we're hearing 
from companies. It seems like the technology sector is still in pretty solid shape, but you know, some of the others are still very cautious. Yeah, well, we've seen that divergent in the co- divergence in the economy over the last few years. If you look at the business sentiment surveys, the PMIs, we've seen a manufacturing sector that, in you know, reflected in those surveys, yep. has been modestly contracting for 14, 15 months now. And the service sector, while strong, has been moderating. And so it's not surprising to me if you look across companies and sectors, you are seeing a difference between services, manufacturing, and then even within subsectors. And I think uh, that's likely to continue. Rebecca, we got to go to your wheelhouse, which is dollar currency analysis and that. What does the strong dollar, the resilient dollar, what does that signal? Well, in in the last 24 hours, it's simply a reflection of the March rate cut being pushed back to yeah. so higher short-term but interest rates. I mean, in the rates, last six but- months, the last year, it's been extraordinary how we've seen resilient dollar and underperformance of international equities. It's just been yeah, absolutely no. stunning. I agree with you, Tom. You know, you have to remember that compared to when we started our careers and trade flows were the dominant cross-border flow, today it's capital flows. And where does capital go? Capital go goes where growth is stronger and ideally where valuations are attractive. Right. Now, U.S. valuations, we can argue, are not so attractive, but growth is so much more attractive right. in the United States versus the rest of the world today, by and large, Money keeps coming here, and that keeps supporting right. the do- dollar and U.S. stock markets. Sounds like Bob Cinch from years ago at Bear Stearns. Okay, Bob Cinch or Rebecca Patterson, great, except the great destabilizer is Japan. If we finally get Japanese mm-hmm. yen instability, what does that mean for our YouTube viewers in America? It, you know, Japan has been one of the few overseas developed markets outperforming the U.S. of late. Um, based on reflation, better growth, stronger inflation, but not too strong. And now the question is, if the Bank of Japan pulls back from that aggressively easing monetary posture and you get a stronger yen, does that undermine exports in Japan? That's been a big engine of growth and a big engine of the reflation for that economy. So the stronger yen on the back of less easy monetary policy, higher yields, um, it, to your point, we don't know how big a destabilizer that could be. It certainly could pause the equity rally there for some time. Again, underscoring the, the attractiveness of being in U.S. large caps. Um, but I think I think it's going to J- Japan has shown that they're going to be very incremental, very slow about this. The last thing they want is a disruption. Yeah. Rebecca, just real quickly here, geopolitics front and center, of course, for global Wall Street. How do you how does that factor into your outlook here? Do you, do, you, do you buy some gold? Do you try to hedge it? How, how do you do that? I, I do think a small allocation of gold, and I'm talking about in a portfolio, probably something between two and five percent of the total, um, is a good hedge, not only against geopolitical risk, but also the possibility that we have a harder landing. But I think in the case of geopolitical risk, what you always have to ask is, if this risk becomes reality, does it have a material impact on my view of the economy globally or in that region? And does it have a material impact on markets? Why the market doesn't react is because so far, it doesn't change your broader economic thesis. If if we do see that change, then the geopolitics will matter a lot. And unfortunately, it's the sort of thing that happens quickly. So you have to plan ahead. You have to do your scenario analysis now, because when it happens, you don't want to be reacting with the market moving against you. Rebecca Patterson, thank you uh, so much. Greatly appreciate it. We're going to turn serious here. And I want to get to some mathiness here. So stay with me on this, folks. We're with Sri Kumar, who we can always do high-level economics math. Sri, to be honest, and Ethan Harris wrote a brilliant essay on trend out on LinkedIn a couple days ago. I mentioned it yesterday with Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president, and Richard Clarity, the vice chairman. Sri Kumar with us. And, and Sri, if we're on trend and the trend is disinflation, the probability is you're not going to stay on trend. And so the Fed is waiting to see if we trend to surprising employment or we trend to weak employment. When we finally get off trend, then what? Then what do they do once they have a data point that cuts either way off trend? You're absolutely correct, Tom. That is the part of the problem. 
in doing what I call seat of the pants uh, analysis and uh, policy uh, implementation because they don't have a fixed path. I have long been uh, recommending something like a tailor rule so that you have the formula in place and you follow it and you don't have the jerky moves pivoting right. from one to the other, which is exactly what you're pointing to. That is the risk. Take a look here in the near term, Tom. December 13th, there is Jerome Powell sending the market upwards like a rocket ship. Right. Yesterday, he pulls it back. What happened between December 13th and yesterday to cause a big change to hawkishness? Nothing. If anything, inflation numbers came out more benign than expected. So this is what is the problem okay. with not having a long-term view on the part of the Fed. The problem I have, I got a Taylor rule, and it's beautifully done out in the Bloomberg terminal. I got the neutral real rate, guess that. CPI, I guess I can grab that. I got a Greek letter named Alpha. We almost <laughs> named Vet Bill Alpha. Then I got a Beta. I got an Oaken Factor. Oh, boy. And I got a Nehru suit I've got to no wear idea. when I look at the Taylor rule. Come on, Sri, this is mathematical mumbo jumbo. How do you use an algebraic Sri Kumar rule when I got a pandemic and a triple stimulus? It doesn't compute. Uh, you do it in two ways. One is the Taylor rule is sufficiently flexible, meaning that it is not a fixed formula. And it basically says that when uh, inflation is above target or below target, what you should what you should be doing when GDP growth is above or below what you want it to be, what you should be doing. And it allows you some amount of flexibility between those terms. You don't have to go to the Oaken rule. You do not have to go to the others. If you follow any particular rule diligently, you would be a lot better off than what we are doing now, where we don't have any fixed principles. That's where I come out at. It doesn't matter what principle you use use something as a rule rather than just decide that morning what you're going to do with interest rates and quantitative tightening. Shri, we've had a number of guests on over the last several weeks, both academics and market practitioners who say the Fed should be cutting rates now. Inflation is already whipped. What, how, do you, how do you view that kind of call? That is the call that Paul, that we had in the 1970s, and we know what how it turned out to be. <laughs> Not so well. Because when you cut interest rates significantly, and if you did that today, the markets would rally. Consumer spending would increase. The economy would then temporarily go on a much faster growth setting. Inflation will pick up, and then it will make it much more difficult for you to bring the inflation rate down. That is the risk of cutting down interest rates sharply today. Shri, are you surprised about how resilient the consumer is? I mean, we just had Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines take their uh, guidance up. People are spending. They're going on cruises. Um, they're going on trips. They're buying stuff. Are, I, I'm actually kind of surprised how resilient the consumer is. There are two reasons for that, Paul. You raise a good point. First of all, I think there was an immense amount of fiscal uh, stimulus that was provided to the economy. At the end of 2022, the estimate was for $1.5 trillion worth of excess savings were in the hands of the consumers. So it is being spent the last months of the Trump administration, the initial months of the Biden administration, the stimulus that came forth is still being spent. That's one reason. Second, look at what has happened with the recent numbers on consumer disposable income and savings savings are rising much slower than consumer disposable income. Sorry, I should say the other way. Consumer savings are not rising. Consumers are essentially dipping into their savings in order to uh, finance their spending. And that is going to cause it. Credit card loan defaults are increasing in the case of banks. And that is another way in which the consumer spending is being done. You saw what happened with the banking problems in the last couple of days, I've been writing, Paul, that especially with the consumers, that you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. You're going to see a lot more in the next six to nine months. 
So given that backdrop here, um, do you think the Fed is, that message yesterday was pretty clear. We're, we're, don't bank on us cutting rates in March. Do you think that's the right message? And do you think that message is subject to, you know, if the data changes, maybe they'll change? Uh, if you, I would say that if they stick to March and if they wait for inflation to significantly come down before they cut rates, that is the correct policy. But if what Jerome Powell does is to switch messages from meeting to meeting, from December to this meeting, with no change significantly happening in the economy, that is going to be a problem. It's going to cause volatility. It's going to cause uncertainty in markets. But unfortunately, that's the way the Fed operates. Yeah, I, I look, Sri, and, and, and you know, could we, we could like talk to him for like an Forever, hour. Forever, yeah. You have no guess. Lose Lisa, you know, lose Barb. Just exactly. talk to Sri Kumar. He's out in Santa Monica, too. How good is Shree, that? Sri, there's a lot of, th yeah, I know, he's smarter than we are. Yes. Sri, just to, to wrap this up, is there a theory at the Fed now, or are they literally staggering from meeting to meeting? I think it's the latter, Tom. I think they are staggering from meeting to meeting. Uh, Powell tells you that they are data dependent, which means they act based on the latest data. And that may not be what is good for the long term, but unfortunately, that is the Fed formula right now. And you have heard it from the chairman, not just from me. Sri, thank you so much. Sri Kumar, uh, with this here. This is an important conversation. It's fallen off the radar, but it is gospel for Margie Patel. She has been doing this for ages, and she has been right, right, right. And one of the important things is she shifted from coupon to dividend growth in terms of a measured portfolio at Allspring Global Investments. Margie, it's really fallen off the radar in this great lift we've seen in the equity markets, which is use of cash, share buyback. We'll hear that from the tech companies today, but also dividend growth. One of our guests, Paul Sweeney, uh, is apoplectic about this, that Apple, that Microsoft should install a responsible adult dividend policy. Margie, should they? Um, I really wouldn't uh, be in a position to judge that. I think that, uh, for example, Microsoft has been exceptionally strong in uh, their capital expenditures. So I would rather look at the long term and see that they're using their cash wise to invest for future growth, not necessarily give right. back. Paul, I think you're onto something here. I'm going to jump <laughs> in and say I get all the rationalization of not doing a dividend, but there's something American about it. That's as simple as I can put it. Yeah, and it's just it just goes to the issue of these tech companies, Margaret. We're going to hear from some of the big tech companies there for the close tonight, and and we're just marvel at the free cash flow that these companies generate here. What are you looking for after the close here today from you know some of the real leaders in this marketplace, some of these big tech names? Mm -hmm. Well, we saw some yesterday, and I think we'll see more of the same today, which is <clears throat> they still have a strong, sustainable growth well into the future. And it's more a question of the market's nervous. The market wants to have a little correction. So we saw a negative reaction yesterday when uh, the big three reported. Maybe we'll see that tonight. I think the market will chop around here because it just wants to have a little bit of a correction. But still, the fundamentals look great, so there's no reason why these stocks shouldn't go up all year and do decent, uh, decent holdings. It's, well, you know, part of that, I assume, is going to be uh, earnings that are going to have to come through here. And I see kind of, you know, uh -huh. high single, low double digit earnings as, as I look forward on, on the Bloomberg terminal here uh, for the next 12, 18 months. It, do you feel like there's earnings risk in some of those numbers? Uh, yeah. No, I think most of them, most of the big tech companies have a path for sustainable growth for as far as we can see, in other words, several years. And the surprises, we've had a few of them, negative sun surprises, have really come from other sectors, whether it's healthcare, transportation, things, industrials, things like that. I mean, Paul, we got to frame this out. You know, I get hysterical about this. Paul absolutely nails it, folks, in the brutal cor correction we've had. We're down 1.9 percent in the Standard and Poor's in the peak, and my oh, long-term log exponential moving average is is down a plunging 
2.9 percent <laughs> in this bull market Run that's a daily hills. chart paul we are addicted to going up every day it seems like it marky we we heard from some federal uh fed reserve yesterday looks like you know gonna hold steady here the bank of england today holding steady uh, what's your interest rate outlook here for a constructive equity market uh, well, really, to me, a 4% across the curve looks pretty constructive for the economy. <clears throat> um, and I think short rates will come down, whether it doesn't seem like it's going to be March. But really, it's been irrelevant to the strength we had last year in the economy. Um, very strong employment, consumers in good shape, businesses in good shape. There's no sector under stress. So in a sense, you might say uh, Federal Reserve and next interest rate action is irrelevant to the equity market and to the economy overall. Market we're, lifts. We're yeah, market lifts here. Margie Patel driving the market higher. Paul <laughs> Sweeney, NASDAQ up half a percent off the carnage, I say, we saw yesterday. Exactly. All right, so Margie, we're going to have some big tech numbers uh, tonight. Presumably, they're going to be pretty, pretty solid. You know, and Tom Keen, of course, was long Magnificent Seven, so he's just clipping coupons at this point. What do the rest of us do who maybe have missed that trade here how do we kind of approach 2024 in terms of trying to find some opportunities well i think you have to look at companies that have a path to above average future growth and really not be hung up on the fact that well this has been a great stock great future but it's up a lot over the last year so therefore i'm not going to buy it i think that's never a good reason to buy a stock because it's already been up Marie, the yield market is speaking and i'm going to look at the 10-year real yield which framed out at about a 1.80 and plunge is the right word, folks. The inflation adjusted yield is now plunged to 1.65% on a chart. If it hits a 159, 1.59%, that's a huge deal. What does the stock market do, Margie Patel, if the inflation adjusted yield, that restrictive cost of money yield, if it really breaks down to a lower level? Well, it just says to me it's another positive factor for sustainable growth. And what's different with this cycle is companies use the last decade, <clears throat> as consumers did, to restructure, take advantage of zero interest rates. So they really aren't very hurt by when the Fed raised rates. It really is not a big matter to them when the Fed cuts rates. It's more what's their prospective return on investments. So we had another little scare yesterday, Margie, in, in, the, in the banking space with New York Community Bank. And I think... Most analyst research that I've read says it's kind of specific to New York Community Bank, maybe some of their uh, loans and so on. Are you concerned about the financial system or do you think banks are a good place to, to go in 24? Uh, well, I think there's so much regulation. Um, I think I'm pretty lukewarm about the banks as a growth vehicle. Uh, personally, I think they should put back in the uptick rule <clears throat> because I think that's what's enabled people to pile into a name and destroy its equity value and raise concerns about their, their going forward. And uh, I think that that's really a problem. Yeah. The Fed was too quick in raising short rates and got the banks in a bind as far as the assets they were holding. And Margie, what do people do that didn't participate? I mean, they went down in the pandemic. Maybe they went down. Maybe they're in triple leveraged all cash. Great. But what mm -hmm. do the people do that didn't participate in the Margie Patel bull market of last year? How do you catch up? Well, you can't catch up for the past ever, <clears throat> right, John? But you just have to say from this point forward, are there attractive returns in the equity market compared to just holding cash? What's the condition of the economy yeah. overall? And I they, you have to be positive and say, I'll make more money in, in equities than I will in short term, even though short terms are, say, 5%. Okay. Margie Patel, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate Thanks. it with All Spring uh, today. Today's front page is with Lisa Mateo. She had so many choices today. It was it was an unlimited bounty, I say, a bounty of headline choices. Lisa, what do you have? All right, since we were talking about Tesla, this is like the big story. The Delaware judge ruled must pay package was too much. I found a different angle to it, a story. This is in the Financial Times that it's saying that the lawyers who represented the shareholders they could get a payout worth billions of their own, of okay? Course. So they're gonna add, they may ask that Delaware court to pay them up to one third of how much value was restored to shareholders. How much could that be? That's up to the court, all right? But the stock-based incentive package at issue, it was initially valued at 2.6 billion. 
Yeah. But it grew to $55 billion, as we knew, because Tesla hit those financial performance share price targets. So the lead lawyer of that firm, it's called Bernstein, Litowitz, Berger, Grossman. They said it could be a few weeks before they submit that fee request. Sure. They haven't said what it's going to be yet. <laughs> Somebody, Paul, help me here. But the basic idea is you're on the Cell Express in Wilmington. You sort of, it's off to yep. the left as you go yes, by. Yes, it is. But the answer is they really don't care about image or media or PR. It's like the hardball court. Yeah. That's how I look. Am I right? Yeah. And it's, you know, supposedly, and I think for most cases, it's very pro shareholder. Um, and, you know, that's kind of just what they're all about here. So the lawyers here are saying, hey, we potentially save shareholders $55 billion or whatever the number is. We want our piece. Where's my cut? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good for <laughs> Next. that. Next. All right. Uh, demand for air travel, it's not only returned, but it has surpassed the pre-pandemic really? levels. Really? Yes. Cool. This is for New York City air, area airports. All right. One More than 144 million passengers. That's what came through. We're talking LaGuardia, JFK, mm -hmm. and Newark. The breakdown, LaGuardia had a new high, 33 million passengers. JFK had more than 62 million. Newark had a pretty good jump to nearly 50 million. But then you have a lot of the construction. I mean, you've been to yep. the airports yep. lately, right? You've seen Terminal Newark. Terminal A is yes. awesome. Terminal A, awesome. yes. And now they're going to be replacing that, that air train B. system, yep. too. Yep. I went on the air train at Newark like, I, you know, it was like a nightmare. It, the thing is like ancient. Like I'm looking down going, am I going to make it? That's exactly. why they're, they're going to replace it. that, right? Yes, they're going to replace and it. And it's needed because when I'm there standing, there's like a a, 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 a stairwell, Paul, that goes down to nowhere. nowhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's people going to another terminal on a bus, I right? think so, yeah. So they're doing it. I'd say Terminal A is they great. Are. They're doing Terminal B now. So they're, you know. And LaGuardia, too. They had LaGuardia Terminal LaGuardia's done a great C. job. Yeah, yeah, they had the Delta Terminal yeah. C. And then JFK, they're in the middle of it now. They're but, in the midst well, of gonna their Well, they're going to be doing JFK forever. Forever. Yeah. Yeah. Larry Summers <laughs> once lost it, the, one, the former president of Harvard and uh, doing so much with David Weston. Summers went mental at a conference I was at over Terminal 1 at JFK. <laughs> right. He said, this is a third world terminal. Yeah, yeah. He's right, of course. <laughs> of course. All right, uh, <laughs> finally, we're hitting the Wall Street Journal. This is a new dining trend. Yeah, so I'm, I'm troubled by this one. Yes, they love the steakhouses, right? They like the ambiance, the drinks, the people, but they don't want to get the steak. What? So the steak's really? too expensive. That's the problem. Wholesale yeah. beef prices are up. A steak dinner is going to cost like a hundred bucks a person. So they don't want to dish out that. You know, they're they're sharing steaks, sharing plates. I have to admit, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I do the sharing, and they're they're offering smaller portions, like four ounce steaks are coming on the menu uh, okay. pretty soon. Right. But it's a health thing too. I mean, more people. Wow. Or health conscious. But if you're not eating the steak, you're getting, what have they got? Lobster? They have a lobster they, dish they and then the maybe fish. a fish dish and that's it. Chicken. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess. No, I don't you don't know. go to the steakhouse okay. and no, have no, chicken. No. Okay, no. this is Keen's Steakhouse with, yeah. a, with the pipes up top. No relation to me. That's Great my go-to place. place. I, I sit Ooh. to the right yep. of the bar Absolutely. there. Sure. It's sort of like Lockovers in Boston you look at years Keen's. ago. Yeah, I, I got lamb chops. Okay. The legendary mutton shop is 68 bucks. <laughs> The prime New York sirloin is $62. That, that's that my go-to. That used to be $49. Oh. Yes, it did. So if you got four people, you're popping two forty before oh, sure. before you hit before the wine. Before cocktails. The <laughs> I, you know, I mean, it's a lot. The, the appetizers here, twice. I'm getting hungry. Twice <laughs> baked Vermont blue cheese puff. Yep. You know, it used to be like eight bucks, nine bucks, nineteen dollars yep. now for yep. an appetizer. Yeah, you got to dig in the wallet if you're going to it. You and I should go. That'd be fun. You and yeah, I should go down absolutely. there. Absolutely. You know, sure, they love me Michael, there. You know. Sure. Send the bill to Red Oak. Yep. Of the yeah, Amex. Yeah, you know. That'll be fine. <laughs> Cha ching. Yeah. Very Lisa good. Lisa said we had to go. So you split your steak? Do you get the. the... I, said, I do do that sometimes because they, they give you these huge portions oh, yeah, it's and ridiculous. I never finish yeah. it. Like the tomahawk is like the, the size <laughs> of it. You know, it's huge. Um, so we split it. So they let you do that now because they, they there's charge a lot you. of restaurants. Oh, they charge you they for charge the split. They charge you. But it's cheaper than getting two. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. Now, do you have a household of people who eat meat, or do you have any non-meat eaters? No, we're all carnivores. Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. There we go. We love a steak. <laughs> all right. Very but good. they do can have I, vegan options. Over? That's a thing. Everybody at my house, even vet bills, it's all tofu stuff. You Ooh. know, it's oh. all like Asian, you know, it's like tofu and... It's not even gluten-free. It's just no. tofu. <laughs> tofu. I'm but you, sure. you can bring steak leftovers we to get the dogs. We want to a third dog. We want to name the third dog tofu. Don't <laughs> 
you know, I mean, okay. All Lisa right. Mateo, thank you so much. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.